verses 1 through 5. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourself likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh of the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you, who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Let us pray. Oh, Father God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for being with us in this past weekend, holiday. I thank you, Lord, that we can gather with family. But most of all, Lord, that we could have used that time to share your word. For all of us need the word of God. All of us need your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you for the safe travels as well and for those who are continuing to travel. May you bring them back safely, Lord, without incident. And Father, I thank you, Lord, for your very presence. Thank you, Lord, for being here. And we do invite the presence of your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for all that you have done, uh, done for us, how you have blessed us so richly, Lord that we can be here this morning, that we can uh, have sufficiency because you are the provider. You are the God who gives us all these things. And Father, we pray and lift up those who need your touch, your healing. For Sister Morgan, pray you touch her. Lord, by the stripes of Jesus, we declare healing. And we agree in prayer and by faith to appropriate the healing. For Brother Shane as well, Brother Richard, Brother Chodon, for C. Young Gibson and his mother, Lord, Sister Pick, Sister Victoria, Sister Rachel's father, and Pastor Jesse's full restoration. Father, we pray for peace in Jerusalem. Pray for peace on the Korean Peninsula. Peace in Nigeria, Kenya, Ghana, South Sudan, the Republic of the Philippines, and the United States of America. And Father, we do pray and lift up our presidents, pray for your protection and that you give them wisdom, protection also for their families. We pray for wisdom and protection for the Etoan Methodist Church pastors, spouses, children as well, and also for Victory Christian Fellowship pastors, spouses, and children, and all the VCF members as well. Thank you, Lord. And we do pray, Lord, for you are the provider, you are Jehovah Jireh for 100% full time gainful employment for everyone in Victory Christian Fellowship that need jobs and Father that you are the one that's going to provide for them that they need not look Lord for connection the only connection is with you and you are the provider you will open that door thank you Lord and for each one of us that you would stir in our hearts that all of us, that there be 100% faithful service of every member here, that they would do it with joy to serve in all the ministries that are needed. And Father, I thank you, Lord, that you have provided for us. And now and we want to just give to you, Lord, our lives, offer our lives as that living sacrifice. May we do your will. May your kingdom come and your will be done in our lives, in our families as well. Bless us now, Lord. And again, we do invite the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us, to, to keep us alert, expecting to receive from you. We thank you, Lord, that your word shall change our lives, that we will be transformed, our minds renewed. 
And we do ask that your angels surround this place and protect it against demonic attacks, interferences, and disturbances. And thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you. And I ask that you anoint me with your Holy Spirit, that, you'll, that the word shall go forth with power to touch each one's hearts. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. We give you all the glory, all the honor. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I give the Lord a praise clap. For God is good and all the time. Okay, look at someone say, I love you with the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Good to see each and every one of you that uh, you made it back safely. Amen? And I know some people are still on their way, so keep them in your prayer. This morning, we will learn about living according to the will of God. According to the will of God. And this is pretty tough because a lot of times... People would like to know specifically what God has for them. Well, I have good news that God has something specific for each and every one of us. Amen? But are we listening to God? Are you listening to what he says? See, that is where the problem lies. That, one, we may not be listening to him. And secondly, we may not be obeying what he's saying is his will for our lives. Of all the billions and billions, and I don't know, maybe 7 billion people in this world or more, and it's growing, right? Everyone, God has a will, a perfect will for each and every one of us. And I guess the, the bottom line is learn what it is as soon as you can, and that way you don't waste time. Because I know that um, it took me about... 30-something, maybe 30-something, close to 40 years to figure out what his will was. Though he was speaking to me, I was not listening because we can clutter our minds, our, our hearts with, with, and thoughts with things that we think are the right things, right? And everyone likes to walk around and say, I'm going to do the right thing. We all have the right intentions, but we have many plans but not every plan can be of God. So the sooner we can find out what the true will of God is for our lives, the better we can get on with God's work. And the people in Israel, when they left e Egypt, spent 40 years walking around in the wilderness. So we don't want to be people that have been walking around 40 years around in the wilderness even though we may, may have accomplished a lot, done great things, um, but we were not walking in its perfect will. And there is a perfect will. And I want you to be convinced of that. Just doing anything is not the will of God, okay? People think, well, I'll do it and then ask God to bless me, and that's his will. But it may not be his will. And it may take maybe a course correction in our lives. And... Um, some people think, well, I've already attained everything. I got everything, so I can just do what I want, and I thank God for everything. But we still have life in us, and, and as you still have life in you, let's maximize. Let's look, look forward to um, knowing the will of God, obeying, and then, and then doing what his will is. But how are we going to do that? So Peter was saying that, in the past, we would do the will of Gentiles, the will of our, even our flesh, because we thought maybe that was fun and that was a good thing, because if it feels good, do it. If it feels right, it must be right. But we learned last week and even the week before that the people during the times of Noah were thinking that they were doing the right thing until the floods came, and suddenly they found themselves in hell. And, and so we don't want to, um, I'm not going to be that drastic, but we don't want to live this life thinking that we lived a good life and, and everything was fine and we never killed anyone, never harmed anyone, and then find out that we had not been doing God's will. Let's learn this. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the perfect example of doing the will of God. So we are going to examine the 
in, in whatever time I have, and of course I can't give an exhaustive um, uh, um, explanation of, of his will, of, of, of what the Lord Jesus Christ did, but I, I just want to get into some depth about the will of God, uh, how to walk in the will of God. So Jesus, in Luke 2.51 the Bible says, and he, Jesus, went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them, but his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. What happened was, at the age of 12, Jesus and his family, well, his family took Jesus to the, to the temple, to Jerusalem. And we know that Joseph lived in a place called Nazareth, so they had to walk a distance to go to Jerusalem to do their sacrifice or to do whatever they had to do. And Jesus remained behind as the family left them, right? They went back to Nazareth, and then after a certain period of time, they said, hey, anybody see Jesus? No. Did you see? No. So Paul, his father, mother, like, ah! you know, it was like uh, they probably were scared, right? I remember that happened one time, and some of you may recall, we were in Narita Airport, and... Um, that time, my son, the elder one, was only about this tall, so he might have been less than two years old. So, you know, some of these bathrooms are built like this, where you, one side is the woman, one side is the male, right? The men. So, we're walking with our son, and he's he's following us. So, my wife goes into the woman's side, I go into the men. We, we each are thinking that uh, the son, our son, is with the other one, right? So happily we do our thing and come out and we're looking for, we're looking for him. Where is he? Ah! So we started, so I can understand, I can imagine what Joseph and Mary were thinking. So they, they traced back all the way to Jerusalem and they found Jesus there in, now he was a lot older, he was 12 years old about, they found him in the temple speaking to the uh, the wise men, the the uh, the religious leaders, and then later on they they kind of scolded him, said, "What do you do? You got us worried and everything, right?" And uh, so parents, watch your children, okay? Amen. That's the moral of the story. No, that's not okay. So um, anyway, so then Jesus uh, goes with them back to Nazareth, and the Bible says that he was subject to them. So we get a glimpse, a very small glimpse of, of how Jesus began to walk in obedience to the will of God, okay? And the first part is, as a child, he was obedient to his parents. And parents are going to watch out for their children, and they're going to give instructions, and sometimes children don't want to follow the instructions, some of you with babies going to find that out. Right now, you got 100% control, okay? 100% control. But later on, you're going to find out they have their mi a mind of their own. Well, Jesus was subject to his parents, meaning he obeyed his parents. And this is until um, the age of 30 that the Bible says that then he began. He went to the River Jordan. So it begins with childhood. It begins where we begin to obey our parents. Now, some of us would like to just forget about that past, but we were disobedient to our parents. Look at someone and smile. Just smile and look back. Don't accuse anyone of anything. Okay, so we were, um, Jesus, the example, obeyed his parents. He submitted to his parents. He did not run away. Like, I'm going to find my own place and run away and, and do all these things. He obeyed his parents even until the age of 30 years old. So it's important, parents, that children obey you, right? Because the next step is they will get to a certain age when now they will come under the authority of God directly. And so when I pray for children, I always pray that they obey their father and mother so that when they grow older, they will begin to obey their parents. Uh, excuse me, God. 
if you, can, if you cannot obey someone you cannot see, how are you going to obey, oh, someone that you can't see, how are you going to obey God who you cannot see, who is spirit? So it's important, and Jesus followed that pattern where he obeyed his parents, and then at that point in time, and you don't have to be 30 years old, but at that point in time, then the Father, God the Father, told him, you're going to go and now start the ministry. So now Jesus can obey the Father because he has this, this spirit of obedience, the spirit of being subject to authority. And it's not that Jesus only began to obey the Father at that time, but he began to obey the Father even as a child. But sometimes children don't know about God till later on. But the point was, Jesus learned to obey, to submit to authority at an early age, and then, well, actually throughout his whole life, and then when he was on his own, he was able to obey the Father. And this is what Jesus says in John 5, 19. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do, for what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and sheweth him all things that he himself doeth. And he will shew him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. John 14, 10. Believe, believest thou, thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. He doeth the works. So Jesus learned to obey what the Father was doing. He saw what the Father was doing, and he did exactly that. Not only what he saw the Father do is what he did, but also what the Father said, that's what he did. So everything that Jesus did and spoke was what the Father said and did. And so this is something that it takes this relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ to be able to know how and what to say and what to do. You know, something as in counseling, and as a pastor, I do counseling, right? Counseling is very difficult because the reason why people come for counseling is because they're already broke, okay? <laughs> Unless they're going to get married. Then, then it's because they, they need to get um, instructions on a godly marriage, which most people don't quite know about how to do a godly marriage. So if you're going to get married, get godly counsel, okay? But in general, when people go for counseling, it's because something is broken in their lives, some kind of relation, some kind of thing going on in their life. That's why they go to counseling. Nothing wrong because there are so many problems, right? So many problems in this world. And one thing that I've learned, not being a, a, a sanctioned counselor, if you will, you know, with a degree, counselor, uh, guidance, a certificate, or a degree, or whatever you call it, I always go to the Word of God. So when I counsel, it's according to the Word of God. So if I, if I go according to the Word of God, my counseling can never be wrong. Now, whether people agree or not, because sometimes people come in with, with already uh, preset things, what they want to happen. And, and so if, if I'm not saying what they want to happen, then they disre disregard it. You understand? But when you go in for counseling, you go in with a, with a, a, a heart, a mind that's open to receive spiritual guidance and then um, be willing and ready to, to follow what the Word of God says. Don't come in with, I want you on my side, Pastor, and I want you to blame my wife, and, and the wife says, I want you to blame my husband. Husband and wives, look, look at each other and just smile, okay? All right. If you got a husband or wife, 
uh, just just remember that, all right? Don't come in for counseling. Like, I want you on my side, so so um, so I, we can we can beat her up uh, or, or, or or him up. Okay, that's not the point. But Jesus did only what the Father said or did, and it's quite interesting because what he did or said is not always exactly what we think in our mind. What what is right? Okay, we all think it's right. Right? We all think we know what is right. But he didn't always do everything according to what we think is right, but only what the Father said or did. So that's, that's, that's the point number one. So the Christians are to live according to the will of God. Where do we find that? In Romans 12, 1, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, Unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, what Paul is saying is that we have conformed to the thinking of this world, that we ought not to conform to the pattern of this world. Because the pattern of this world may not be in accordance to the, per, the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And so Paul is saying that there is a higher purpose here, a higher will of God. But we look at, if I follow the pattern of this world, then I, I have succeeded, I have done great, wonderful things. But that is not necessarily so. There is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God that may not be according to the pattern of this world. And so, just because you succeeded in this world, that doesn't mean you did God's perfect will. Now, you can succeed and do God's perfect will, but do not use that end state that Oh, I succeeded. I, I I'm accomplished. I did all these great, wonderful things, and I achieved a lot. I accumulated a lot. So therefore, I did the will of God. You could have lied. You could have stealed. You know, I know people that will do corrupted things, right? So you think basic things here. Some people may have done evil things, right? They may have um, stolen money. They might have done black marketing, but then. They bought a nice house. So in the world, people are saying, wow, you're really successful. You really, you really uh, did a great thing. But the way they got there is through corruption and evil and wickedness. So the end state where you are at, you're at does not mean that you walk according to the will of God. It's better to to end up someone with who just barely made it and walk in the will of God, which means you're walking in per, in holiness and righteousness, than look at what you achieve and have accomplished or accumulated by going through evil, wicked ways. And that's why the Bible talks about the people that are, 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 are full of greed, they're always thinking about how they can do these things. And many have pierced their souls because they, they have tried to achieve great things through doing things that are not uh, right, not even legal in some cases, and have done things in wickedness to achieve that end state. So be careful about your pursuit to find this happiness, to make happiness for yourself. So in 2 Timothy 2.1, Paul also writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus. Paul had done many great, wonderful things. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He was very successful. He was beyond even his peers. He had done so many great things. And then he met Jesus along the way. 
And then and Jesus then gave him his direction for his life. But you notice here in many of Paul's epistles or letters in the, in the books in the New Testament that he writes, he will write that he is an apostle by the will of God. So therefore, even the spiritual people, just because you become a pastor, just become, because you become an uh, evangelist, unless it's the will of God, it doesn't mean that you, you're doing a good thing, of course. Anybody that's in the ministry is doing a good thing. But that may not be the will of God. There was a famous uh, pastor um, who had been 10 years, who had been a pastor for 10 years, and there were like thousands of people that came to his church. And God spoke to him and said, I never called you to be a pastor. But I called you to be a teacher. So he went through a course correction that even though he was, quote, unquote, successful with many people, salvations, baptisms in the Holy Spirit, people getting healed and, and doing all these great, wonderful things, God says, God told him, I never called you to be a pastor, but I called you to be a teacher. So you, you know about apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. Those are five different offices Right in the ministry, we call it a fivefold ministry, and you can be one, two, you can be all five. You know, Jesus was all five, but you can be zero, none of them, right? So this 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 man of God then opened up a, a, a school, a college, a seminary, and um, he found that God had blessed him mightily, just as He had blessed him in being a pastor. You know, when you read Psalm chapter one, right? That if you meditate upon the word, and um, he says, whatever you do, you will prosper. So even if you're not necessarily walking in the will of God, if you meditate and you follow the word of God, you can still be successful. But I, I'm, what I'm speaking this morning is that there's that even finer resolution where you can walk in God's perfect will. will. There is a perfect will of God, as, as Paul wrote. And so let's find that. Paul found out that he was an apostle. He's also, um, he's also a teacher too, and um, basically a missionary. And we see that in 1 Timothy 1.1 1, 1 again. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God, our Savior, and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. So not only is finding the will of God and, and God wanting us to walk in it, God commands us to walk in the will of God. So if we're not walking in the perfect will of God, then we are not uh, obeying God. So Paul had no choice but to walk. Well, he had a choice, but he chose to obey the commandment of God to be that apostle. So we should all obey the commandment, know what the will of God is, and obey what he tells us to do. Is our life, is our life going to be smooth after that? Well, if you read what happened to the Apostle Paul after he um, had that experience with on the road to Damascus, he went through a lot. I think he went through three shipwrecks, uh, many floggings, maybe five times. People whipped him, you know, 40 minus 1, 39 times. Um, he had, he, he ran into trouble, robbers and all that. Uh, the great thing is he was only stoned one time. And that was a great, that was probably the, the highlight of it. But um, he, he went through a lot, a lot of difficulties. So even if you go through um, and follow the will of God, it may not always be uh, something pleasant to go through. But you can have this deep down um, joy in the heart that you walk in with the Lord. So let's see here. I mentioned that walking in the will of God can be very specific, right? Very specific. So in Acts 9, 15, this is after Paul had his experience along the way to Damascus that God told him to go to Damascus, right? 
and he's blinded now. So for three days, he's sitting down, and a lot of things are going through his mind. And I believe he also uh, repented, and he uh, yielded to God. And in, in Acts um, 9.15, Jesus is going to speak to him. But the Lord said unto him, Ananias, the, another disciple, he says, Go thy way, for he, Paul, is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So we see here God can be very specific in what he wants you to do. And in this case, the Apostle Paul was given specific instructions that he was going to be the Apostle to the Gentiles. So God can speak spe specifically. We all think that as long as um, all these things are, uh, it feels good and all that, that they were doing the will of God. But God can be specific in your life. And the first thing, the second thing that we need to do is to yield to the Spirit. Yield to God. In Acts 9, 4, Paul, on the way to Damascus, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So the first thing to do is to yield to God's way. Have in your heart this humility that you are going to yield to what he says. And I take this, again, this um, the short testimony on, on, on how God spoke to me. And um, I was willing to, to follow Jesus. I had gone, got, got to this point in my life that even though I had accomplished things, all, all that did not satisfy me. So I wanted to seek his will. And... And the first thing I did was say, um, Jesus, be the Lord of my life, and I will submit to you. And that, that's the first step that we need to do. And then, then I met him, well, he met me, well, I met him, and he began to show me my whole life. In about a second or so, he showed me my whole life. And this is not like I'm drawing in the, in the ocean or anything. But just like uh, in the spirit world, God can, can show you these things about your life that you didn't know. And all the while being self-assured, I thought I was doing the great things for, for my family, for God, and everything else. Until you realize, until he showed and revealed to me that everything that I did was out of selfishness. I did it for myself. I thought I was doing it first for my country. Then I thought I was doing it for my, uh, for my family. And then later on, he showed me that everything that I did in my whole life up until that time was for myself. So all I could do was repent and say, God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Jesus, for, for living this life, this pompous, arrogant life. And to stand in the presence of God naked, right, where you have nothing else except this, this, this dialogue with the living Jesus. And that's why I, I know, without a doubt, Jesus is alive. He is alive. He's not just a picture He's not just the logos, the word alone. He's alive. And so he knows every single, he knew every single detail of my life. And I was just appalled. I was so shocked because I thought I could hide all these things, but he revealed it. It's like an onion. He peeled off the skin. He peeled it all off. 
And then he showed me who I was. And then I came to this point, and I told him, Lord, what do you want me to do? Lord, what do you want me to do? And here you see in, in, in Acts chapter 9, the Apostle Paul saying, Lord, what will thou have me to do? But if you look like in the NIV or some other version, it will say, Lord, what do you want me to do? And having not known the scripture at that time, I was quoting exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying. So that is what we need to do is to be to submit and learn to yield to 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 the to the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you have that attitude, then you can begin to find out what he wants you to do. Because he can tell you everything what he wants you to do, but if you have a stubborn mind, you're going to do what you want to do, right? So why should he w waste his time and uh, tell you something that he knows that you're going to reject him? So he's looking for that soft-hearted person. You're not flaky. You're not uh, confused. You're not double-minded. You're just saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? So now you yield. You have a submissive spirit that is going to be willing to, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Remember, Jesus was full God, but also full man. He was subject to all the emotions and the, the things that the man was, but he never did sin. And that, that's the difference between Jesus and us. Though he was full man, full human, he did not sin. Even though all the, uh, the devil and other people tried to tempt him, he never sinned. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, prior to he being arrested, Jesus went to the uh, garden. He told the, the, the larger group of apostles, just wait here, minus Judas. And except uh, James, John, and Peter, he took him closer in, and then he went further beyond them. And he began to pray, knowing that he was going to suffer, knowing that he was going to get persecuted, be arrested, and abused. He knew that. And he says this in Luke 12, 11, 2. He says, And he, Jesus, said unto them, When ye pray, say, O Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, as so in earth. And pray that his will will be done. This is the Lord's Prayer, excuse me. So when you pray the Lord's Prayer, you're praying that God's kingdom come come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven so when he went into the garden of Gethsemane Jesus prayed this in Luke twenty two thirty nine, 39 and he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives and his disciples also followed him and when he was at the place he said unto them pray that you enter not into temptation and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou be willing Remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy, thine be done. So as much as Jesus wanted to not go through the suffering, he said, let your will be done. Not mine, but your will be done. So Jesus, being that example, where he said, not my will, but your will be done be done and then he is going to get arrested and then um, he's going to get uh, persecuted and then he will die on the cross and so in our hearts we should say that God not my will but your will be done not my will but your will be done and God was going to speak to you he will tell you what you need to do. And whether you're young, middle-aged, or older, it doesn't matter. We still need to seek what the will of God is so we can do his will. Amen? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for 
your word. I thank you that Jesus is alive. And Father, may your kingdom come and will be done in our lives. That we would learn that there's a greater purpose in life. And not having gone through our lives and saying, I wish I had done your will. But that we can start to do your will right now. And we can be submitted in our spirit to the, the, the Holy Spirit, to you, Jesus, so that we can do and know and hear your instructions. And, Father, we want to be able to, to do your will. Thank you, Lord, that, that you love us. We thank you that, that your desire is to have the gospel spread throughout the world. Let us be used as your vessel to share your gospel. And I thank you, praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Will the ushers please come forward for the receiving?